I'm pleased to introduce Julian Wildman next. Uh, Julian Wildman is a dancer, choreographer, and teaching artist based in Helena, Montana. She grew up in Colorado, splitting her time between the Western Slope and the Denver metropolitan area. This stoked a lifelong pursuit in the complements and contrasts of natural science and human cultural vibrance. Julian graduated cum laude from Bard College at Simons Rock in 2013 with a BA in cross-cultural relations and dance. She pursued coursework in interdisciplinary art and media at Columbia Col College Chicago before relocating to Helena for a tenure with AmeriCorps, serving at Exploration Works Science Center. In 2020, Julian received a fellowship through Intrepid Credit Union and the Holter Museum of Art to create Body in Motion, a dance film and immersive installation exploring evolutionary biology and comparative anatomy. As a performer, Julian has danced on many stages and sites throughout Montana, notably as a soloist in Cohesion, Cohesion Dance Project's Nutcracker on the Rocks. Julian's teaching practice is, a, is vital to her creativity, she is a Montana teacher leader in the arts through the Montana Arts Council and the Montana Office of Public Instruction. She has taught art, dance, and creative movement in schools, residential living facilities, group homes, dance studios, and nonprofit arts organizations. Her span of students include early childhood, adolescents, adults, geriatrics, and individuals with special needs and physical and or developmental disabilities. So welcome, Julie. Um, so I just want to hop into, I'm going to talk a little bit about my practice in general and then about what I have done over the course of this residency. Um, a lot of my practice is based a lot on embodiment, which I think is a word that gets thrown out quite a bit um, without a lot of thought. But I do really think of it as like very deliberately exploring your experience of having a body, and I think it's a really great way to kind of get in touch with yourself and with others and with the world around you. Um, as a teacher, I find that it's a really useful tool for building empathy um, and like just skills of how to think about other people, other organisms, other things. Um, so I kind of, I put together, let's see if I can, I put together this graphic kind of of, of my, my practice as um, balancing embodied research and academic research. And as anybody who has ever researched anything knows, um, you never actually conclude the research. You just find new questions that you then want to research and get really stoked on. So I've got this circle of embodied research that involves a lot of moving in the studios or leading workshops or leading classes and reflecting. Um, back to questions and back to movement. And then academic research, I feel, I, I really love um, just kind of like consumer media in the sense of like documentaries and podcasts and, and ways that people try to make science writing accessible um, and then jumping off that into kind of peer-reviewed journals or scientific papers, having the opportunity to be at the lab and actually talk with people whose research is focused um, specifically in these areas has been really, really fantastic. So here are a couple of stills of um, ways that I've used that research practice in the past. On the very far left is a still from my dance film, Body in Motion. Um, in the center is a still from a live performance, Death of Others, that explored human grief and empathy. And then on the far right is a workshop that I led with the Helena Middle Schools about human migration. I, one of the biggest things I think about when I'm making my work 
is um, Access Point. And I, I feel like I'm very, very excited about science. I'm very excited about biology, but I don't really expect that that's universally true. Um, and I, I really think that it's important to find a way that people can engage with art. I'm definitely a person who doesn't make art just for myself. Well, I make some things just for myself, and I didn't put any of those in this slideshow, but you can talk to me later. Um, so I try to make art for an audience. I also try to make it not just for like professional dancers. I think it can be a little bit intimidating to see um, like art has this like intimidation factor sometimes. Science has this intimidation factor. So making something that has an easy access point in order to get both of those things is um, very immediate as I'm creating. Um, and I think as somebody who works with kids especially, I'm often filtering this through the lens of, is this something that's accessible to a kid? And of course, that's glossing over a huge like range of, of interests and personalities and development. Um, but my primary, my primary access point is definitely aesthetic. Like I do want to make something that is like visually appealing and um, auditorily appealing and something that people want to consume. Of course, understanding that there's a lot of taste, but I just want to get that serotonin pumping. And when I wrote that in this bullet point, um, it autocorrected to serotonin pumpkin. <laughs> so I just went ahead and made a serotonin pumpkin. <laughs> I was like, that sounds amazing. Like a little jack-o'-lantern with the serotonin. <laughs> Which is kind of my next access point is humor. Um, I think it's a really great way to talk about serious things. I think it's it's a really good way to get people on the same level. Um, I, I think when you don't take yourself too seriously, other people don't have to take you too seriously, there's, um, there's a lot of really good conversation that can happen. Uh, I also use narrative and elements of narrative. Not all of my work is story-based, but I definitely use character and elements of plot and action and, and narrative to give something to hold on to. Um, I also do a lot of classes and outreach. Often it's, it's purely selfish. <laughs> it helps me to be able to bring something to a group of people and present things that I'm interested in and kind of get feedback about what is interesting to other people, what is resonating, how are people interpreting research in a different way or in a complementary way. Um, and then the last point is um, my materiality. I really like using recycled material. Um, I like using easily accessible material. I think um, art shouldn't have to be expensive to create. I think like if you want to go for those like awesome supplies, they're more power to you, but it shouldn't be a prerequisite to creating. So I try to reflect that in my work. Um, these are little critters down here are made out of toilet paper tubes. So um, as I was going through my notebook and trying to figure out um, how to relate what my general practice is to this experience of um, open air, I, I just like, I saw all of these sketches and crazy ideas and I did like a little bit of a, a crazy move. Um, just really briefly, Jesse was able to dive pretty deeply into the research at the lab right now of the rhinoceros beetles, and I got like so excited. They currently have the insects from the Missoula Butterfly House and Insectarium, so just go into this room and there's all of these like funky creatures that you wouldn't believe existed if you didn't see them. Um, there are several graduate students who are doing various work, like Ramon is doing work on stick insects, and Kani is doing work with genetics, and Sophie's doing work with the rhino beetles, so just being able to talk to people who are like passionate experts in their field is really exciting. Um, and then of course, Doug has like an extensive amount of research about animal weapons and animal structures, and just like, again, very seemingly outlandish things until you you've seen them. So here's just a rapid fire of ideas that I found in my notebook over the past four and a half weeks. Beetle homunculus, so like a map of a beetle according to 
how its brain maps it. Uh, beetle maracas, beetle tinder, <laughs> beetle Mari Povich show, <laughs> tactile sound armor, so like something you could put on and you could like feel sound. Record the sound of a millipede on a drum, double bass cubby that you can sit in. Here's a little illustration of a dance-off. So it's a series of dance battles that get increasingly complex and showy, and it demonstrates competitive strategy. So, you know, the better dancer wins, and then they both are doing the better dance, and then that, oh, the next one has a better costume, and then the next one is crazier, and then uh, I guess there's confetti, and that one gets eaten. Oh, no. Oh, no. All right. Um, a sixth arm, a wearable that connects another set of arms via a puppet string apparatus so that you can have six arms like a bug. A trapdoor jaw that's wearable um, and it snaps shut when you bite down on the lever. There's the, there's the jaw. A chair dance, which is again a dance off, dance battle, um, where the dancers use various size of chairs to signify weapon size. Um, spoiler, the biggest chair wins, but other spoiler, the people with the smaller chairs sneak in the side. <laughs> Ooh, silk and pheromone, I, this one's a little bit uh, tricky to explain. So one dancer kind of walks around like trailing a scarf, kind of like Ariadne leading to the Minotaur style. Other dancers are not looking and they kind of pull on the scarf and then they Lady and the Tramp meet in the middle. Knights who joust in beetle armor, a beetle soap opera, um, mythologies that are recreated with animal namesakes, uh, so like a Hercules beetle that slays a Nemean lion and a Hercules beetle that fights a sea hydra. Um, a cult, a man looking at like some of these animal behaviors, especially the very charismatic ones that protect huge harems, yeah, what if the cult, like the Beachmaster elephant seal, was actually a cult leader? So it's like a combination of a documentary and a cult expose. And then a girl's guy, <laughs> um, a, a tips about femininity based on um, different animals. So uh, there's a jacana up there. Doug knows a lot about jacana. So if you are curious about how they fight each other and how they, um, um, how they parent, they have very different parenting styles than, than our traditional lead. Basically, they, I'm, I just, I want you to talk about Jacanas. Very different seahorses, very different parrot, uh, or uh, peacock spiders, they eat their mates, there's all sorts of fun stuff. Whew, okay, so those ideas are out of the way, thank you. Um, this is what actually ended up happening. I think I split my time pretty, pretty substantially just into two realms of, of movement and sculpture. Um, I felt it was really amazing not only to get the chance to be at the lab and working with the insects, but I was able to have a studio in the Fine Arts Building on campus, and it was just like a phenomenal resource to have. And then space to move at the West Side Theater, which is like just a, like a gorgeous open space with an amazing floor. So I really tried to utilize those spaces while I was here. Um, and I'm gonna talk about my movement kind of in two different um, frames. One is with the workshops. So as I mentioned earlier, I really do like to engage other people in my research. I like, especially as a mover and a choreographer, I like to be able to try things out with different bodies and see what people's impulses are. Um, I got to work with some, like a little bit of partnering and group work that didn't end up being the focus, um, but it definitely was fun to kind of work on social behaviors of insects and, and figure out how to kind of, kind of interpret that. Um, but I wanted to kind of give context to my workshops and my teaching methodologies uh, by kind of leading us through there, there's a movement sequencing called the brain dance, which anybody, any movers in the audience are probably familiar with, but it's developmental sequencing in the brain and the body. It's very popular with especially teachers of younger children because it integrates 
your mind and it integrates your body. And as I was starting to do these workshops and learning more about bugs, I was like, oh my gosh, I never felt more self-conscious about being a vertebrate until like, <laughs> how? So it starts with the breath, with breathing and centering and oxygenating your whole blood supply. And we do that through these great lungs, but bugs, have spiracles all over their body and they, they absorb oxygen. So they're, they're just breathing through their skin, which is like an amazingly calming thing to imagine. Um, tactile, I didn't actually end up getting to put red on this, but tactile is about um, your sensory perception, grounding your nervous system through pressure and through touch. Um, but then when you look at bug anatomy, they're just covered with chemoreceptors. They're like amazingly sensitive to the things that they're touching in terms of smelling and like tasting their territory, who's been there, who's, who is who. Um, and also just the way that they're built with an exoskeleton around goop, they're just these huge resonating chambers. So like the, the way that I would feel is just limited to feel on my surface, whereas a, a bug experiencing tactile stimulation is like very multi-sensory. Um, core distal is when you are supporting your, your distal points far away from you with your core. Um, man, I don't know how much you want me to talk about bug body plans. I don't have to get into that. Um, Head tail, again, so a head tail is working in our central nervous system. Our spinal cord goes down through our, um, through our backbone and then branches out, really radiates out to our distal points. But do not have spines. They, um, they are invertebrates, but they do have articulable parts of their thoraxes. They articulate in the abdomens in varying degrees of complexity. So it's interesting to kind of think about the analogy of a spine and the mobility of a spine to these two different sections. Left and right body, body half. Oh man, there's like a really nerdy body thing I'm not gonna go into on the right left. Um, upper lower is segmenting the body along the horizontal midline and beginning to create complex 3D space. When you look at an insect, its body plan is actually in three parts. So it has a head, it has a thorax, and it has an abdomen. So if you imagine segmenting a bug into a top and a bottom half, it doesn't, doesn't quite work in the same way. Um, and another way to think about this is if we're looking at segmenting an upper part of the, the body and the lower part of the body as here are my upper limbs, here are my lower limbs, all of the limbs on a bug are gonna be attached in the thorax, which there, there are three parts to that thorax, so it's, it's also separated into three. They love threes. Is it Illuminati? I don't know. <laughs> Cross-lateral is when we start to move um, in a way that is asymmetrical across the midline and it creates um, complex three-dimensional movement. When you're looking at somebody walking, often it's you know right foot forward, left hand forward, and, and then it switches. When you look at these bugs, they're, they're walking in a star pattern. So you, this is why the, the six-arm apparatus didn't work. They have the front and the hind leg and then the middle working at the same time. And vestibular system, so, so uh, waking up your vestibular system, like spinning and, or like making your head go around, getting yourself momentarily dizzy and then recalibrating, getting yourself settled. I have no idea how bugs balance. Um, I have no idea. That is a big question. So here's a little bit of my movement research, and you can just play it. Um, this one is about body segmentation. So the questions that lead into this research are about um, thinking about a head and a thorax and an abdomen that move independently, a rigid exoskeleton that's moved by internal pressure instead of muscles that lever an endoskeleton, um, and joints that move 
like with very small musculature instead of like large muscles that are connected from like the middle of a joint to the middle of a body that's just very uh, acute. Um, as I was playing with the insects, it's very, it's very good. You'll just have to imagine it. Um, <laughs> um, I, basically, I was thinking about, how, you know, bugs that just walk on the ceiling. What? I didn't get to walk on the ceiling, but I got to, I got to play on the wall. We could just go to the next one. Um, leaf bugs, I ended up doing a lot of leaf bug movement. Um, if, you, if you look at a leaf bug, if you ever have an opportunity to look at a leaf bug, they kind of like stagger around. They look like they're drunk. They look like they need to be cut off. And, and really it's because their bodies camouflage as leaves, but also their behavior is camouflaging to like a leaf canopy. So if you have a straight linear movement in like a crazy jumble of leaves, it's very easy to spot. Whereas if you have a little drunk leaf insect kind of just stumbling around. So my movement score um, was a lot about how to use indirect pathway and retrograde and swaying on an axis to, to kind of replicate that. Um, and then I ended up doing a lot of work with film and overlay. Um, the leaf insects, they're just like this really magnificent green that kind of reminded me of like a green screen. Um, and I was like, oh, I wonder if that works. And kind of, it kind of did. So I mean, we're just, there's a couple of experiments. There's, there's definitely a lot of different aesthetics that I'm playing with here. Sorry, it's not supposed to have sound. Um, so that was the first one where I tried to layer movement inspired by a leaf bug with an actual leaf bug. This next one is one of those frustrating artist things where it's the first one that you try and you're like, oh, this is just going to be the random idea and it turns out really good and then you're like, oh, I'm going to invest a lot of time and energy and it turns out that the first one And then this one is like a beginning to play with different video effects, I guess. Oh, you get like a little snippet of anti-gravity.
this one. Um, as I was filming these leaf bugs, but they're only like, you know, they're, they're not, they're not huge, huge creatures. But oh my gosh, they're a handful for being something that's like only like a thumbnail size. They are, they are, they are just doing their own thing. And I, I had this experience where the first time I filmed with the, with the raindrops and the jittery, were like, they were doing such cool things. And then every time I tried to make a stable environment, they just, they just booked it. They're just like, nope. Or they were totally still. Like there was no, there was no interesting in between like jittery movement. They're just like either not going to move or just going. So I had, um, I had named one of the video clips that I got Fast and Furious. There was another one, but Fast and Furious too. <laughs> and I was like, well, we should just uh, do that. It's time for the week to go home. Keep your eyes on the road, cowboy. Are you nervous? He did the stare and drive on you, didn't he? He got that from me. What's his deal? I got a problem with authority. You just need to chill out. You ready for this? Come on, man. Guns, murderers, and crooked cops. I was made for this, bro. They've already, they've been through the hardest part of their life already. <laughs> I should have put a thank you slide. But thank you. 